Our concern now is with voluntarism and reform. Voluntarism and reform. We have been dealing in our evening classes with the principle of voluntarism, whereby after 1740 and the Great Awakening in particular, instead of things being handed down from above by statist action, the American principle as it developed and became a unique contrib contribution to world history was for voluntary actions on the grassroots springing out of faith, out of the convictions of the individual man. So the churches created not as established churches, state supported, but supported by the people. Various reform movements, schools, everything, instead of state established, representing the faith and the convictions of the people. As a result, a wide variety of reform movements in the early half of the 1800s began to spread and for better or worse became major forces on the American sea. These movements by the Unitarians attracted their zeal and their fervor so that they had all the passion of the old-time Puritans, ready to go out and conquer the world, only not for Christ now, but for their faith. What they did was to take the Puritan attitude which still lingered in their midst and to transfer this into a totally secular, totally humanistic context. Now, this is the kind of thing that abounded in that day. One kind of moral reform after another, some good, some bad, but influenced by the spirit of voluntarism as it was carried outside of the Christian fold into the Unitarian and other circles. Another such movement was the women's rights movement. In 1848, there was the Seneca Falls Declaration and Resolution on Women's Rights. Now, there was some cause for the women to feel distressed. In biblical law, I deal with the movement, and I point out how, after the War of Independence, the laws with regard to women went downhill and a woman was progressively deprived of all her rights so that a woman could be literally robbed of everything she inherited by her husband and she had no recourse. The condition was truly an ungodly one and it is to the shame of the churches of the day who had been so caught up in emotionalism that they did nothing about it and it remained for the secularly minded to do something about it but even then these women who did work on it were while justified in a great deal of what they did operating on humanistic and equalitarian premises now, the Seneca Declaration is very interesting in that it was, in effect, a copy of the Declaration of Independence of 1776. I'm going to read it to you because I think it is so interesting, and yet in spite of its equalitarian ideas, much that it had to say about what had been done to women was true. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one portion of the family of man to assume among the people of the earth a position different from that which they have hitherto occupied, 
but one to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes that impel them to such a course. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights governments are instituted, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of those who suffer from it to refuse allegiance to it and to assist upon the institution of a new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. And then it goes on to speak of the long train of abuses and usurpations and to declare that such has been the patient suffering of the women under this government and such is now the necessity which constrains them to demand the equal station to which they are entitled. And then they go on to give a long list of complaints and resolutions. In a sense, it was justified, despite their qualitarians. Because the women could say, as they did say, some of us are well treated, we have good husbands, but as far as the law is concerned, we are, to all practical intent, the moment we marry slaves. We've been stripped of all legal rights. And in the eyes of the law, we are like children, incompetent. Wherein are we different from the black slaves? After all, many of the blacks have good masters who treat them well, who are very earnestly concerned about their welfare. So many of the masters are like many of our husbands, good husbands, good masters. So we're not complaining just because some masters are bad that slavery is wrong, or because some husbands are bad that the situation is wrong, but that in principle, the enslavement of women, stripping her of all legal rights, reducing her to the status of a minor who is mentally incompetent and whose affairs, whose money, whose wealth, whose property immediately passes to her husband when she marries is without justification. Now, at this point, they were clearly in the right. The condition of woman was not a product of Scripture. It did not exist in the Middle Ages, nor did it exist in the colonial period. It was a product of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment deified reason. And when it deified reason, it saw man, the male, as reason, as though somehow more rational than women are. You still find this attitude surviving. Uh, I don't know whether you've seen uh, the movie My Fair Lady. If you haven't, you've missed it. Real treat. It's a, it's a delight. And there's a song in it that goes, uh, Why can't a woman be like a man? And uh, Professor uh, Higgins goes on and on. Why can't she be sweet and reasonable the way men are? Why can't she be sensible like a man? And so on and so on and so on. The whole thinking being just in line with this, men are reasonable. There's no problem until they tangle with women, and women are so unreasonable. And of course, this is the thinking of the Enlightenment, that, the, that reason is the property of man and emotions are the property of women. And in terms of this, because the Enlightenment deified reason, it put man firmly 
in control and said, well, since the woman represents emotion, she obviously is incompetent. Now, there is nothing like this in Scripture. What Scripture does say is that while the man is the head, doesn't mean necessarily he's the smartest. A man may be an officer, and there may be a lieutenant under this officer who's smarter than the officer, but the captain is still in charge. You may be a lot more intelligent than the pilot who's flying the plane, but he's still in charge of the plane. There's a the principle of authority. So, in the church and in the home, the man is given authority over the woman. It is not the authority of a king over a slave, but the relationship is as a king with his prime minister. And if you want to see the kind of authority and power and dignity the woman has, look at Proverbs 31. A very competent woman, a wise business manager who can handle her husband's affairs and estate. But with the Enlightenment, all this has changed. And the result of this kind of thing, the worship of reason, and the downgrading of emotions, and saying that women somehow didn't have reason, just they were just emotional creatures. A woman became something that was incompetent by definition, and therefore was consistently downgraded. We still have a great deal of this kind of thinking amongst us. We haven't wiped it out of our minds because habits of a couple of centuries of thought, habits of thought for two centuries, do not disappear from a culture immediately. But the effect of this was deadly, and it led to the enslavement of women, their total deprivation of rights. There are one or two states where this type of thing is still on the books, and rather ungodly things happen. For example, a woman whose husband was an alcoholic, no account, immoral, who deserted her, and yet she didn't have the ability to get a divorce in terms of some of the laws in the state because for desertion so many years of waiting were required. She went to work, built up a business, and began to make a life for herself and her children, and her husband was able to walk in after several years, take all of that, leave her with nothing but the clothes on her back, and it was entirely legal. Now that still prevails in certain places, unless it's been changed in the last year or two. But this kind of legislation, in particular in those areas where the European influence was the strongest, Texas law with regard to women is very bad. Some of the eastern states still have it. The further west you go, the more uh, the woman has a better status. But some of the old laws from the influence of the Enlightenment still prevail in some of the eastern states. I don't know what's like in Pennsylvania. It could have been changed in the last few years. The laws of Pennsylvania used to be very unfair to women. Very unfair. As a result, the women's rights movement had a great deal of justification. And it began to make great headway, but because the nation became involved as a result of the Civil War in a long war, and then after that, all the problems that ensued, reconstruction, conflict over that, the women's rights movement was shoved to the side. And it took the beginning of this century for it again to get underway, to be able to command public interest. 